and welcome to our webinar on what's new in Azure. Uh, today, Steve will be running through the latest changes in Azure flow and the announcements from Ignite. We'll also be focusing on managing multi-cloud workloads um, as a particular focus for today's session. We're running today as an interactive session. We've got some demos, a few slides, but feel free to ask questions as we go. Before Steve kicks off, I just want to do a very brief one pager around Silversands to cover off the introduction. Steve, if you mind uh, changing on to the next slide, please. Yep, sorry, Mike. There we go. Perfect, thank you. OK, so we've been in business for 34 years and we're a professional services organisation specialised in Microsoft consultancy and supports the enterprise market. Yeah. We focus in the following areas. So at the top, the large circle is Microsoft 365, which comprises of three key components. Uh, firstly, it's Office 365, all the applications like Teams, Exchange and SharePoint and, and more as Microsoft continuously add into that stack. The second component is Windows 10 for your operating system. And the third component is Enterprise Mobility and Security, EMS, for managing all your endpoints and devices. At the bottom right there, the big circle, um, is the infrastructure side. So we work uh, to deploy, manage and govern both on-prem and cloud infrastructure solutions using Microsoft Azure. Um, we've seen a huge surge in enterprise organisations moving over to Azure in lockdown to gain that flexibility and the scalability up or down during these uh, uncertain times. And the larger circle, so the bottom left, um, is for the Power Platform for rapid deployment of business applications, reporting and dashboards using Power Apps, Power Automate, Power BI and Dataverse as well. The three smaller circles around the edges are for identity, governance and security. <coughs> They're all crucial aspects for technical implementation to enable that seamless and protected end user experience. So linking all of those circles together, we'd like to consider that our support banner. We offer anything from reactive support through to proactive support all the way to that managed service on any of these Azure or 365 applications. And at the heart of what we do is people and devices. And we think that's the most important part. Once you've implemented all this technology, it's no good unless people and users start using it and get it. So to embed that, um, we have a change management methodology and run a series of user adoption workshops uh, around all of those elements. So that's Silver Sands in a slide. I'd like to welcome Steve Hewitt, our senior Azure consultant, to kick off the webinar. Steve, over to you. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so, uh, as Mike touched on, we're, we're going to sort of have a sprint around uh, some of the announcements at um, Ignite, uh, which uh, went off um, over the last last couple of weeks, really, um, from Microsoft. Um, there's a lot of announcements that have really sort of come to fruition in the last um, in the last few months from last year's Ignite as well, where things have come out of preview and into production, or they've um, come sort of out of private preview into public preview. So um, we'll touch on those as well. Um, and as, as Mike touched on, it will uh, there's a, a bit with the thread between some of the topics, um, which we'll see, which is really to do with hybrid cloud um, and management. Uh, so we'll move on. So what we're going to do is we'll cover off uh, four uh, key areas. We'll start off with Azure Firewall Premium, uh, which is a relatively new uh, newcomer. That's in public preview. Uh, we'll then move on to Azure Stack HCI and Windows Admin Center, uh, which uh, will tie into Azure Arc and then uh, we've just got some new features that they announced in Ignite and then we'll finish off with uh, Azure Bicep. So without further ado, we'll move on to Azure Firewall Premium. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so Firewall Premium is a uh, fully stateful, well Azure Firewall itself is a fully stateful um, centralized network firewall as a service. Uh, from Microsoft. Um, it's got uh, sort of network and application level protections, um, which can be used across both different subscriptions and virtual networks within the Azure, your Azure, Azure environments. What they've introduced uh, in public preview is a new SKU or new tier. Um, so they've rebadged re the existing Azure Firewall to Azure Firewall standard, and that will continue to be in place. Um, nothing changes with that. What they've, what they've got now is Azure Firewall Premium. Um, so Azure Firewall Premium supports both inbound and outbound filtering, um, but it's expected to be used primarily for outbound and east-west traffic, um, mainly for cloud-native workloads. Um, 
inbound protection is typically used uh, for non-HTTP or HTTPS protocols. So this could be, for example, RDP, um, SSH, FTP. Um, for the uh, for the primarily because there is a, a slightly uh, superior product, the Microsoft Offer, for inbound HTTPS uh, traffic, which is the web application firewall. Um, the web application firewall is um, is a feature of the Azure App Gateway uh, product, which is a centralized inbound protection of web applications, um, from, mainly from sort of common exploits and vulnerabilities. Uh, Azure Firewall, Azure Firewall Premium, um, it also provides inbound protection for non-HTTP and HTTPS workloads, um, as well as uh, outbound network level protection for all ports and protocols. Um, so Firewall Premium, um, is got some interesting new features. Um, there's a new feature called Firewall. Uh, so it uses Firewall Policy, which is a uh, not to be confused with the generic Firewall Policy uh, across the board with an IT. This is a, a separate configurable item specifically. Um, so it's, it's an uppercase within uh, within Azure and within, within Azure Firewall. Uh, firewall Policy is a global resource that can be used across multiple firewalls. Um, and you use this with, uh, again, a new product called Azure Firewall Manager. Um, so Azure Firewall Manager allows for you to centralize your policies and implement a hierarchy, which if you've got multiple firewalls, um, it really simplifies policy management um, in those environments. The, um, we'll get onto the new features uh, specifically with uh, Firewall Premium in a, in a minute, um, but the new features we'll touch on, they're configurable via firewall policy only and firewall policy you can manage with or without firewall manager but uh, firewall policy is the only way um, or, or graphical way to manage the new features within Azure firewall premium um, the firewall rules um, the classic firewall rules uh, that continues to be supported um, and that can be used for configuring existing features of the standard firewall um, within Azure firewall policy can be managed independently uh, or using firewall manager um, firewall policy that's associated with a single firewall um, there's no charge uh, or cost with that um, so <clears throat> excuse me so you can have firewall manager and have multiple file and have your firewall policies if you've got a single firewall um, being managed there is no charge for the firewall manager or firewall policy feature you only pay for azure firewall premium itself um, if you're um, so if if you've got a multi uh, a multi firewall uh, and, and or multi policy um, configuration within firewall manager, there is a there is a cost for that. Um, the cost for that is about just under seventy five pounds per month per region per policy, um, and there's lots of permutations for that depending on your network topology and architecture um, and how things are defined. So it's very difficult to get a, a precise cost on that so it depends on specific configurations and deployments um, but if you're using it for if you've got a single policy um, which can have multiple rules in that single policy um, on a single firewall within a single region there is no cost for firewall manager or for firewall policy itself um, so the the other moment as mentioned as a firewall premium um, it's currently in uh, public preview so anyone can uh, access this and deploy this now as it's in preview. Technically, uh, Microsoft uh, advised that it shouldn't be used for production workloads as of yet. Um, and as such, the support and SLA reflects that as well. Um, Microsoft will will or can provide basic support, but it is a strictly best endeavors basis um, for, for anything that's in public preview. And again, whilst there is an SLA, when it's in production, which is the same as Azure Firewall Premium, so 99.95%, um, that technically doesn't apply. There's been no service credits applied if there was an issue with Azure Firewall Premium issues, if you deploy, if you deploy that today. To reflect that though, there is um, there is currently a, a pricing discount, so it's about 50% cheaper um, than, uh, than it would be in production. Um, and overall, once it is in production, it will be about 40% more expensive than firewall standard. Um, what that equates to today, so the current costs, um, it's uh, about 65p per deployment hour, um, and uh, not, uh, it's 0 0.006p per gigabyte processed, which is so six, six pence per 100 gigabytes. Um, but that includes a 50% discount um, as it's in preview status. 
So moving on to the, the actual uh, nuts and bolts or what it can do and what it does, um, the features. So there's four key um, functional uh, features within Azure Firewall Premium, um, which puts it above firewall standard. So and they all, all hands in sort of go in lockstep um, with each other. So uh, the first one is TLS inspection. Um, so Firewall Premium will decrypt your outbound traffic um, and it will uh, provide um, or perform the required value added security functions that are further down in this list, the other features. Um, so it will uh, decrypt the traffic, it will perform the relevant security um, security features that we'll discuss in a second, and then it will re-encrypt that traffic and send it on to its original destination. Um, <clears throat> This means that Azure Firewall Premium will decrypt traffic using certificates, which will need to be stored within Azure Key Vault um, before it re-encrypts the traffic. Um, this is done using a managed identity, um, so that again, it's all everything's uh, authenticated and authorized um, as part of the chain. It should be noted that it doesn't support um, Quick, the, the Google, well, it's, it's now technically an Internet Standards Protocol, um, which is so it's UDP-based um, QUIC Quick um, protocol. Uh, traffic decryption and uh, obviously it will only do traffic running on uh, HTTPS you know, port 443 um, for obvious reasons as it's uh, HTTPS traffic um, requires certificates. So th the that's uh, in and of itself um, obviously isn't, a, isn't a, a, a particularly useful feature shall we say but it, and it enables the following features to be um, to be used the key feature here being that once the traffic's been decrypted or if it's not already encrypted traffic then there's an intrusion detection and prevention system um, so again above what the uh, file standard can do uh, file premium provides signature based uh, IDPS um, that provides uh, sort of very rapid detection of attacks by looking for certain patterns. Um, for example, uh, by sequences in network traffic, uh, no malicious instruction sequences um, through malware. Um, one thing to note is that IDPS allows you to detect traffic in all ports and protocols for non-encrypted traffic. When HTTPS uh, traffic needs to be inspected, um, as a firewall, you, a firewall premium uses a TLS inspection capability we mentioned above to decrypt the traffic and then better detect the malicious traffic. Um, but that's why the TLS uh, inspection feature above is, is is so key. So out of the box, without any certificates or TLS inspection capabilities, um, all traffic other than encrypted traffic will be uh, will be uh, sub or can be subject to the IDPS uh, platform. Um, the IDPS itself, there's um, certainly within the user interface um, there's very limited uh, options for managing uh, managing that it's pretty much a, a on or off option and we'll touch on that shortly um, there are options to uh, upload or configure bespoke signatures and policies um, and patterns via powershell or azure cli that currently isn't available in the in the ui um, that is on the roadmap um, but at, at present, it's uh, it's in terms of the user interface, um, you, it's uh, it's effectively all powered by Microsoft's uh, threat intelligence feed. Just quickly on the threat intelligence feed. Um, <clears throat> so this is um, again, this is enabling your firewall by default. Um, this is where you can alert and deny traffic to and from malicious IP addresses and domains. The IP addresses and domains are, are from the Microsoft threat intelligence feed. Um, this is used for nearly every other Microsoft, um, primarily cloud technology, security technology, um, as well as it's also tapped into by various on-premises uh, security uh, technologies that Microsoft do as well. Um, so it could be Azure AD password protection, Exchange Online protection, um, even Azure Security Center. So this is Microsoft's global centralized uh, threat security feed um, that's used to inform um, there's cloud security posture across the board. So your file will, will have a, a real time direct feed um, into that. <clears throat> um, if you've enabled uh, threat intelligence based filtering, um, which again is on by default, the rules of process before any of the NAT rules, network rules, replication rules, um, you can choose just to log an alert when the rule is triggered, or you can choose to alert and deny the traffic. Um, so that's that's the the, the killer feature, um, or if as far as Microsoft's concerned, and that's what puts this primarily above Azure Firewall standard. The um, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, again that goes in lockstep with TLS inspection, uh, and this is the, again the, the key feature uh, they want you to consider using, um, and why you'd 
generally speaking, we'd opt for this above firewall standard. Um, the only thing to to note around this is that if you're, um, is again, as I sort of touched on previously, the Azure App Gateway, um, and particularly the Web Application Firewall, is the go-to solution for your inbound, um, is for securing your inbound web um, web services, um, websites, uh, various app services. So this is predominantly for outbound traffic, uh, for managing outbound traffic, and for uh, for managing your east-west traffic within sort of um, between different VNets, for example. Um, in addition, um, and this is where some additional features can come in quite useful, um, there's also web categories and URL filtering. Um, so web categories allows the administrators to allow or deny user access to the internet based on categories. Um, so it could be social, social networking or search engines gambling. Um, and again, the, the intention of this is quite common with um, doing this without bounds internet proxies for many years. Um, and this reduces the time spent on managing individual fully qualified domain names and URLs. Um, this is also available in Azure Firewall standard, but it's based on fully qualified domain names only. It doesn't allow a full URL blocking. So that way um, you can categorize a certain page to be denied or allowed whilst blocking the, the home page, for example, or the site um, or different different uh, areas of within a website. So it gives you the more granular access um, of categorizing websites and web traffic. And uh, again, closely related is the URL filtering. So this allows users to access um, specific URLs for both plain text and encrypted traffic. Um, and this is generally used in conjunction with the web, web categories just mentioned. Again, this looks at the full URL rather than just the domain name, which again is a, is a limitation of uh, Azure Firewall standard. Um, and uh, finally, as with Firewall standard, it uses Azure Monitor uh, for your for logging, so you can then interrogate that using uh, Power BI, Excel, pass it into Azure Sentinel. Um, and it also um, one significant benefit is it's pre-certified for PCI DSS um, and also ICSA labs. For PCI DSS, that means that it's uh, pretty much an off-the-shelf um, solution for use case uh, use case for payment processing scenarios. Um, so that, that gives us again, it's something that is a bit more of a benefit around compliance if you're doing payments, uh, if you're a payment provider or payment handler. Um, one what we'll just mention around this is one of the primary use cases like I said is less for protecting your inbound um your your resources within azure although it is very competent at doing so if it's web traffic that you're trying to, to protect against a web server a website app services then again this really isn't the tool to protect for that certainly not exclusively the web application firewall profile within uh, App Gateway would be the go-to solution for that. This is really, um, it's an additional tool um, to use as part of your defense and depth strategy. But the the primary feature really is to, is if you for non-web traffic that you want to secure and provide IDPS features, um, and for managing your outbound traffic, uh, a key couple of key points around the outbound traffic or east-west traffic um, is if you're using uh, a VDI implementation, so Windows Virtual Desktop within Azure, um, RDS, um, or if you have got, or if you want to just have tight control, tightly controlled management of your outbound traffic, um, to say, for example, to prevent the possibility of uh, uh, if you get a malware infection for it to contact the command and control server, then this is again where Microsoft are pitching the solution. Um, if you the VDI in particular or RDS environments, this gives you effectively a, a, a web proxy for end users um, without. Uh, having to have a third party product, um, spin up virtual machines, route your traffic back on premises to use your existing proxy solution. This gives you that, that ability there. And again, some some organizations, especially they've got a, quite a small um, on, uh, on premises network um, or info, uh, user base, it may well make sense. You could have a lot of your traffic, you, you could even force tunneling so that all your internet traffic from on site effectively could even be off your remote users users rather could even be routed out over a VPN or express route into us into your VNet within Azure and then filtered out through your Azure firewall premium. And again, you've got the web categories and the URL filtering to provide that level of protection as well as the IDPS as well, which again is provided across the board. Um, so it will help protect you. So, so the most common use case scenarios would be just to, just to provide that additional layer of protection for your servers um, to mitigate uh, accessing command and control servers um, uh, and various other botnets. And also if you're hosting any non-web server uh, function, 
um, uh, within Azure, it provides a good layer of protection for that as well. So they have the primary pro use case scenarios, um, as well as uh, acting as obviously a, a sort of router, NATing, traditional firewall, uh, firewall options as well, and to provide good segmentation between different VNets you might have if you're using a, a HubSpoke uh, topology in particular. So, um, oh, just ever so quickly, um, what I may do, I'll just ever so quickly share, uh, share my screen. Um, and share with you uh, on the Azure portal, um, in particular the user interface side of things. Um, so bear with me one moment. So um, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, so as I mentioned, using Azure Firewall Premium, you do need to use the firewall policy um, resource within um, uh, within the Azure portal. That can be encompassed into Firewall Manager if you're using multi-firewall deployments. Um, the firewall, uh, firewall policy, just to quickly show through the user interface, there's not a huge amount to see. Um, again, it's uh, security as a service. One of the benefits is you haven't got uh, a lot of onerous configuration to, to put in place. So this is a, a firewall policy, um, just a demo, demo one that we've just created. So again, just to uh, make a note that you can do a hierarchy and have parent policies in place, which again means you can have your universal or your global policies applied across the board to multiple firewalls um, and have that hierarchy. So you can have different policies. You can have one global policy, even if you're not using a centralized hub spoke um, where all your egress traffic leaves one firewall, you can still manage, still have consistent firewall rules and policies in place. Um, and likewise, you can have rule collections as well. Um, so that these are nice and reusable um, and set your priorities a bit like you have with an NSG. Uh, we've got the usual bits and pieces around sort of DNATs, network rules and application rules. Again, another big benefit of uh, both Azure Firewall Standard and Azure Firewall Premium is that you've got the ability to do your application rules and your tagging. It's aware of your resources. So you can say all of my um, app services, for example, within my VNet, uh, apply this policy and then it's dynamic. Um, so you don't need to uh, manage an onerous list of IP addresses or subnets, for example, um, as well as, of course, integrating nicely with DevOps um, philosophy as well. Um, so you can make a change to your DevOps, uh, to, to your CICD pipeline, make a change, and that can also update a firewall policy as well um, as part and parcel of that. Um, still, it features um, DNS proxying, if that's uh, something of interest or use. And here we come into the threat intelligence. So again, apart from allow lists, um, fully qualified uh, domain names, um, effectively, again, we've got the threat intelligence levels disabled on uh, alert only and alert and deny. And TLS inspection, again, that's on or off. We have to set a certificate uh, from a key vault uh, if you wish to use that. And the uh, IDPS uh, feature, Again, uh, we've got quite limited uh, options here to set, but again, by default, it's on for alert only, but you can set that to deny. Um, the signature rules, um, that, again, this is very this is very new. Um, this is where you can set a signature ID um, and you can put in a bypass list. Um, anything more complicated than that, you need to drop into PowerShell to do, uh, do configuration there. Um, so that's, uh, that's that. Let me just reshare my, my uh, deck for our next section. Hopefully that's come back up. OK, so um, that's as a file. We'll move on to Azure Stack HCI next. Um, so Azure Stack um, is a family of technologies from uh, from Microsoft. Um, so just to quickly touch through the ones we're not going to discuss. Um, Azure Stack Hub uh, on the left is the disconnected scenario there uh, with a nice picture of a cruise ship or a, a container ship. Um, this is effectively a, a pre-engineered rack or racks um, of Azure for on-premises consumption, um, which requires no or very limited connectivity back to the wider internet. So this is to provide full PaaS, um, as SaaS and IaaS, um, the full, st full stack of Azure services um, in an offline environment and as a pre-engineered solution. Um, on the other far side, you've got the Edge with the satellite dish and the manufacturing and the, and the lorry. That's uh, Azure Stack Edge, which is really for, again, that's another pre-engineered solution, and that's really for um, Internet of Things, machine learning, uh, sensors, um, where lots of data can feed back into uh, these Azure Stack Edge appliances. And then that can then be fed back to the uh, Azure public cloud for, um, for sort of, uh, 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 
a, a correlation and for processing that data. Um, but it acts again really as an edge device to uh, uh, collect, uh, add as a collector for IoT and edge uh, edge um, sensors, that kind of stuff. The uh, middle uh, icon of this uh, infographic is the data center one, which is Azure Stack HCI. Um, Azure Stack HCI, um, this is a hyper-converged hybrid data center platform, um, which is targeting at IaaS, so in sp specifically virtual machines, Kubernetes, and VDI. Um, this is a, a concept that spans back quite quite, uh, quite a few years from Microsoft. Um, but they've uh, refreshed things and updated things quite significantly in the last in the last 12 months. It's hardware agnostic. Um, it is so you can use generic x86 hardware or pre-engineered uh, appliances. Um, so this could be from Dell, HPE, Supermicro, um, Dataron, um, or you can quite frankly repurpose uh, some HP DL380s, for example, or some Dell R740 XDs. Um, it runs a custom Azure Stack HCI operating system, which is um, a modified Windows Server 2019 data center. Um, uh, this includes things like the Azure Arc agent, which we'll touch on shortly. Um, and the history of this is rooted very firmly in Windows Server 2016 and 2019, um, and under the software defined data center banner uh, of branding Microsoft used before. Um, effectively, Azure Stack HCI is your x86 hardware platform. Um, so, again, effectively generic servers. Um, they can be optimized for storage or computer RAM, but effectively they're just generic x86 servers, uh, either pre-purchased as pre-engineered solutions or ones that you build your own, build yourself um, or procure yourself. And it's comprised, comprised of three core elements, um, most of which will be familiar to a lot of Windows administrators. Um, Hyper-V for compute, uh, storage space is direct for the virtual SAN layer and the storage layer, and there's software-defined networking, which is um, again a sort of Hyper-V software-defined networking. Um, and in particular, things like switching better teaming. Um, these components give you a composable uh, hybrid, uh, sorry, a composable hyper-converged platform to use using generic servers. So you, you can then orchestrate and manage all through software, your net, your compute, your storage, and your networking. Um, the One of the key differences um, that Microsoft have added and evolved over the last uh, over the last few months is um, this is now delivered as an Azure service, um, which requires a regular check-in to obtain the, check the cloud license. I think it's every 30 days. This does bring some significant benefits because this compute platform or compute storage networking platform um, that you now have sitting on premises or in a co-location um, data center. Um, it now has, as well as even tighter integration to Azure services, it also has uh, other benefits such as Windows Server 2008 R2 uh, support for legacy virtual machines, which again, you wouldn't get on premises uh, historically. Um, and with that, you also get the Azure portal management and you also get uh, cloud integrations. The um, just on the cost, it's delivered as a service, like I said, for the license for the operating system, um, which is about eight pounds per physical core per host per month. Um, Again, this just, uh, again, high level concept. This effectively is a replacement for your Hyper-V or your ESXi environment for your on-premises uh, IaaS style workloads um, for, for whatever reason. Um, regarding the, the cloud integrations, um, again, I, I won't whiz through everything on the list, um, but it's very extensive. Um, so Azure Stack HCI can operate, you don't need to connect it into Azure for any reason other than for the cloud license um, to validate the, the, the host licensing. Outside of that, these are all optional services that can be used, um, but a great deal of these services are extremely low cost and provide a really good story and a good benefits in terms of a hybrid, uh, a hybrid transition or a transition into the cloud. Um, so you've got your on-premises uh, is just like HCI cluster or clusters running uh, virtual machines, maybe some Kubernetes um, and some VDI with quite literally a handful of clicks, a couple of clicks, you can enable disaster recovery using site recovery. Um, as a backup, again, uh, you can replicate your storage. There is a storage migration service, um, again, integrated with, with a user interface, which will, uh, migrate across, copy across your virtual hard drives for your virtual machines um, and will let, uh, is a very graceful and elegant way of migrating virtual machines you don't want to rebuild into Azure. 
Um, and again, you can do uh, various other um, really quite quite clever uh, clever elements um, and integrations into Azure with this, um, which we'll touch on because that, that touches into Azure Arc as well. Um, one cool, very cool feature I like in particular is it, you've got an Azure Stack HCI environment. You're not currently a big user of Azure. You're not really using the Azure services, but you want to just dip your toe in with one or two, I think it's two clicks um, within the user interface. You can uh, tell a virtual, you can have a virtual machine, um, an existing virtual machine, have a new virtual uh, network card with a uh, VPN on it connected up to your Azure uh, environment. Um, all natively without ever going into the virtual machine itself to give you that point to site connection. Um, and it's a sort of small, um, small and large, but these sort of small integrations that make it really easy to use. Um, um, and it's also incredibly scalable. Um, this fundamentally is a lot of the architecture and the building blocks used for Azure itself on the back end. Um, to just give you a quick, quick flavor of the scalability. Um, I won't move through the numbers, but, um, but the high level ones are you know, 16 nodes you can have in a cluster. That isn't the limitation it may first appear, even though you can have some quite significant infrastructure running on 16 nodes. Um, you can stretch and nest your clusters so you can have uh, multiple clusters. I'm not sure if there is a limitation. I think it's certainly in the four figures. So you could have, I don't know, five or six um, clusters. Those clusters can be clustered. Um, all together and managed as a single entity. Um, and you can also stretch those clusters across WANs, across uh, multiple sites and data centers. Um, this allows you to define a failure domain, um, which can span from just a node. So you can have just two physical servers, two nodes, um, and say, look, that's if, you know, if, if, my, if one node fails, I need to ensure there's enough capacity um, for everything to be running on the other node. Um, so that can be your failure domain, but you can scale that into a rack a room or even a full site. This provides similar um, uh, functionality to these are availability zones, for example, with zero single points of failure. Um, and from a cost perspective, um, in terms of uh, it can be extremely competitive because there's no expensive SAN, there's no shared storage or shared anything. Um, it can be as low as, um, I've had it as low as 300 pounds per terabyte of usable enterprise grade VM hosting data with three copies of the data and that's got SSD performance, and there's no single point of failure, and it includes compute, um, which is extremely, uh, extremely competitive. Um, but that's not an ongoing cost. That's, you know, the cost per terabyte for the solution built. Um, and of course, because it's because it's on premises, and you 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 can define and build this um, yourself effectively. Or, um, so I, I'd engage with the client, we'd build up, get the requirements, and we would then build up the components that would be required. So the type of servers, what specification, what modular server, what networking switches, what types of storage, uh, would it be all flash? Would it be a combination of traditional hard drives and then some flash, um, in fl some NVMe drives in front to accelerate that and make it very fast yet very cheap in terms of capacity? Um, is all a conversation you have around the design, um, but it means you've got a really scalable, really flexible and very available platform um, for your on-premises workload um, for whatever reason that you may you may want to continue to have an on-premises workload. It might be part of your stepping stone. Um, it might be that you, you want to move to Azure or to a cloud service, but you're not ready today. Um, you might have to be given a state. It might be today you need to do a hardware refresh. Um, there's lots of different reasons why. Um, and this will, will tie into the next uh, next segment, which is the Azure Stack HCI um, management. So uh, Windows app, these are the different methods, supported methods of managing your cluster. Um, so the, the local management, uh, which has got visibility of all the capabilities, of the cluster and performing all the tasks safely. So it's fully aware of the, the way the storage is presented is all done using PowerShell or using Windows Admin Center, which I'll come on to in a second. Legacy tools such as the uh, MMC and Windows Explorer Shell, uh, they're still supported for most scenarios, not relating to the storage or cluster management, so for local server management. Um, existing tools like um, System Center Virtual Machine Manager, um, they're fully supported, they're fully aware of the entire stack as well, so that investment isn't lost by moving to Azure Stack HCI. Um, the, because you've got with the integration of Windows Admin Center and it's got native integration with Azure Arc, um, which again I'll touch on it shortly, uh, as part of the Azure Stack HCI operating system, you can now manage the cluster and the resources via the Azure portal and even the CLI. 
This includes provisioning things like virtual machines or even Kubernetes um, containers and even virtual networks on premises. You can create, define and build, provision all of those resources using the Azure portal. Um, with, I mean, for, on your on-premises network, which I, I find that really quite a, a really quite a cool feature. Um, again, there isn't really much of a, there's not a great deal else out else out there in the marketplace. Um, Microsoft have quite a competitive edge in this area because they've now got this full stack hybrid uh, pub. They've got public cloud, private workloads um, such as uh, like HCI, as well as the other parts of the Azure Stack family. So regardless of where you are in your your transition to the cloud, um, there is there is. Uh, something there for you using your existing tools as well so that investment hasn't been lost both in people or in tools and windows admin center um, i don't know if anyone's used this yet um, or not it's been out for a couple of years but it's again there's been a big update come out in the last few months and there's a new preview out as well um, this is again um if anyone's familiar with something like Nutanix um, or some of the uh, more more high-end vmware uh, products the when you're using a hyper-converged platform, um, having the user interfaces that you get with those products or with something like Azure Portal where you've got these rich interactive graphs of performance metrics. Um, and you can, you've can got this real this single pane of glass, this bird's eye view of everything that's going on that you can drill down into. Um, that's web-based. That's Windows Admin Center. Um, it's the remote management tool for um, really for everything on premises um, in terms of your, your core infrastructure, anything that runs anything Microsoft. So that's your servers, your clusters, um, Azure Stack HCI, Kubernetes, even Windows 10 um, devices. This will manage products back to Windows, Windows Server 2008 R2. Um, you've got multiple ways of deploying this. Um, you can deploy this, you can literally install it on your laptop or your desktop um, and interrogate other devices um, from there. Um, through to um, deploying it as a multi-gateway uh, device, so multiple virtual machines that are clustered and highly available, um, and everyone in your organization within IT points their browser to that to the, to the web address uh, for these virtual machines that run Windows Admin Center, um, and they can then access the rest of the environment that way, almost like a jump box. It includes features like remote desktop built into it, um, a PowerShell. Um, built into it so you don't need to RDP or use another connection tool to get into every one of your boxes this, this also really can work as a bastion host on premises um, it provides a refreshed UI for legacy um, services and UI such as certificates or task manager you know, local users um, and there's certain newer features like software defined networking the storage migration service which has only got a graphical interface using Windows Admin Center the other big advantage is because this has got a lot of native integration with the Azure services, um, whether that's so deploying one click Azure backup, um, the, the virtual network adapter I just mentioned about the point of site VPN, um, uh, you're managing your rolling out Azure policy, um, the site recovery, um, storage migration, there's, there's a lot there. And one of the key things um, is that it, this brings a really uh, strong security uh, barrier with it in that it can use Azure Active Directory um, for its sole authentication schema. So that way you have to comply with MFA, your conditional access, the auditing policies. And as your as this is accessing your IT infrastructure, um, generally these are highly privileged and sensitive accounts and certainly sensitive assets that you're going to be accessing. So if you've got a uh, your, uh, Azure Stack HCI deployment or even a, a more legacy Hyper-V deployment, if you've got a ring of steel around that from a networking um, uh, uh, point of view and the only real ingress point um, for day to day is via Windows Admin Center and the only way you can authenticate through Windows Admin Center is going to be using Azure AD. You've got a really strong MFA barrier now in place for all your day to day administration as well as all the audit capabilities that come with that. Um, the final thing, the reason I really want to include this um, here is because it, it ties in with the Azure Stack HCI um, and also Azure Arc, which I'll touch on next. Um, but as a quickly, again, I just want to quickly show share my screen um, because uh, oh, there is a very, uh, not a very cool new feature. Um, this new feature means that you now have native integration um, with uh, in the Azure portal. Um, yeah. Yeah, so here is a virtual machine uh, that uh, I built the other day. Um, and you can see it's currently in preview. 
but there is Windows Admin Center just sitting there um, and I can connect to it now when you 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 can I haven't you can I haven't even been onto this machine I've never RDP'd into it I've just spun it up from a template within Azure and uh, previously you can just click a button on here and it will deploy it and you come back 10 minutes later and you have an option here and I just say which IP address do I want to connect to um, again in this scenario because I'm uh, I'm going to use the public IP address of the, of, the, of the server. I click connect and I type in my credentials and uh, hopefully <laughs> God, I love, I love a demonst demonstration. You will see here Windows Admin Center. Um, this is the same as if you're on premise. Um, in fact, it's more limited within Azure or they're adding more features onto it. Um, but you can see here what I mean around uh, the user interface, the graphs, um, things like replacing your legacy uh, um, uh, legacy uh, uh, interfaces, things like certificate management. Um, just having something as simple as this <laughs> of your certificate, your expired and early expired certificates is um, again um, something that was that's sorely been missing. Um, again, PowerShell, you can kill off processes, spin up processes, uh, RDP, and here's my PowerShell session into this into this environment. Uh, into the server straight away. Um, in a uh, Azure Stack HCI cl uh, cluster, this will can manage the cluster as well. So you then get all your metrics, all of this information. You see that the cluster level as well as an individual processing node, and it's Kubernetes as well, aware and VDI aware. So you've got the single pane of glass for all of your on-premises um, infrastructure, and this is what can also enable like, a lot of the feature set to connect your on-premises Azure Stack HCI into Azure as well. Um, right. OK, so that's Windows Admin Center. Uh, I'll quickly move through to Azure Arc. Um, so Azure Arc ties in quite nicely um, with what we've just been touching on. So Azure Arc um, is effectively it's an agent that you deploy on on a virtual machine um, and now Kubernetes um, uh, containers as well. And this allows is the Azure portal effectively to connect or more accurately allows those agents that you've deployed to reach out to, the, to Azure and register, register themselves within the Azure portal within your subscription, which means you've got that management plane, uh, that single pane of glass for your audio endpoints. Um, the beauty of this is that this work this works whether it's on premises or if it's in someone else's cloud um, as well. So if you've got multi cloud strategy, uh, your virtual machines and your Kubernetes, they can still uh, be visible in the Azure portal to give you that single pane of glass. Um, quite quickly, because I'm slightly overrunning. Um, this means that you can deploy things like you, uh, things like um, IT ops and infrastructure can uh, focus on things like uh, uh, organization. Uh, organizing, securing and governing um, all of your assets within using the Azure portal. Uh, so you can use resource groups, that kind of stuff, RBAC um, and Azure policy. Developers can actually then deploy um, various bits and pieces through this through the pipelines. They can deploy to those endpoints, even if they're not in Azure, even if they're on premises or in, I don't know, Google's cloud or, or AWS using the agent um, all, all automatically. You don't the developers don't need to care where it is, so that that again gives you a nice abstraction layer. Um, to again, and you can use again. You've got things like Azure Policy for your compliance and governance. Um, the, one of the big reasons I've included it here today, Azure Arc is natively built into the Azure Stack HCI operating system. You don't need to do anything. So once you connect up your Azure Stack HCI, um, again. Normally, you'd use Windows Admin Center to hook it in, to register it into your um, Azure, uh, your Azure portal. Then you've then got automatically visibility of the lot, everything that's within your on-premises infrastructure. Like I said, whether it's um, Kubernetes, VDI, or traditional VMs. Um, Windows uh, Arc has supported uh, Windows and Linux servers for quite some time, um, and it now formally supports Kubernetes. Um, it's come out of preview a few a month or two ago. The what's currently in preview um, is for Azure data services, which includes Arc enabled SQL managed instances and Arc enabled PostgreSQL uh, hyperscale on any K8 distribution. Um, so if I go to my next slide, um, this again, this dotted line near the top, this infographic, that's the cloud. 
everything below is on premise. Um, so these nodes, um, uh, Kubernetes nodes, but they could eat and your persistent storage is your storage spaces direct provided by Azure Stack HCI, for example. Um, it could actually be from a third party cloud. It doesn't really matter, Azure Arc doesn't care. But if you're running your managed uh, SQL managed instance or your PostgreSQL SQL hyperscale in, in Kubernetes, um, there and you can Arc enable the Kubernetes uh, containers uh, via the Azure Arc data controller. And you've then got your backup, your scaling, your patching, provisioning, HA, your policies, um, and your single pane of glass in the Azure portal, all provided. Um, and Azure Arc doesn't cost anything. Um, whatever services that Arc enabled client uses within Azure, you have to pay for as you would if it, if it was running in Azure anyway. That's it. Um, there's no additional cost to using Azure Arc. So it's a this is the, the, the new features that have come out quite recently um, and still in preview actually, is the ability to now start using, uh, if you use Azure Data, deploy Azure Data Controller, which runs in a Kubernetes container, um, and that can be in Azure Kubernetes, uh, Amazon Elastic Kubernetes, or Google, Google, Google Kubernetes. This allows you to do um, to manage your data plane now as well with, uh, like I said, with SQL and um, PostgreSQL um, SQL Hyperscale. That's uh, again, this is still currently in preview. Um, and it looks like on the roadmap, Microsoft is going to be pushing various other bits and pieces down this line as well. Um, so they're, they're trying to make as a, um, these are portal and these are tool sets uh, universal, even in a multi cloud strategy. And the event Azure goes down, your resources that are running in Google's cloud or AWS are still running. This is purely a management overlay, a management tool. Um, so, and the policies and the backup schedules and everything else, everything's still applied to the client at the client side via the Arc agent. Um, right, last section, um, Azure Bicep. Um, it's a funny name, but Azure Project Bicep, as it was called. So, ever so quickly, um, the uh, as it stands today, there are all current resources within Azure use a management model. Um, and a single API uh, called the Azure Resource Manager uh, or ARM. Uh, the Azure Resource Manager provisions and manages all cloud assets and resources. Having this unified API means consistent results regardless of whatever tool you're using, whether it's PowerShell or the Azure Portal, Azure CLI or the SDK. Um, it also means you can deploy infrastructure as code, which we're going to want for most things like DevOps or CI CD workflows. Um, this uh, again has resulted in the Azure Resource Manager uh, JSON templates, um, which are going to use for DevOps and infrastructure as code. Whilst this gives us this, all these benefits I've just listed, um, it's the JSON syntax and the output, um, often referred to as ARM templates, they're very verbose, they're very hard to author, and they're really not particularly friendly. Um, so what Microsoft have done, um, and then this is just, just announced in the last couple of weeks as being production ready, um, and I've used it, and it's, it's really very good, is quite an abstraction layer. Um, which sits above your ARM JSON. This keeps all the good things about the ARM JSON uh, templates. Uh, so it's declarative, uh, declarative is uh, idempotent. It targets the ARM API. It still has all the pre-flight checks, the what if, the confirms, loops, conditions, and it's got IntelliSense support. Um, by, so you write your BICEP it, uh, file, it then gets transpiled into ARM JSON. And it can go vice versa. You can take an ARM template and uh, and uh, decompile that into Bicep if you wish. Um, you can still use your existing ARM JSON templates, um, uh, so none of that is, is is wasted or used. It's not one or the other. You can use uh, because it sits on top of ARM templates. So up until very very recently, a couple of weeks ago, you would write your Bicep file, you would build that that would spit out a ARM template, um, a JSON file at the end of that, and you would then deploy that JSON template. Um, that's moved on now um, in version three, um, which means that you don't need to do that. You can now deploy a BICEP file straight in um, to your uh, ARM API. Under the hood, it's still doing exactly the same thing. It is converting that into an ARM template. So there's no difference there. Um, and that's it is just a much easier way to write your write your templates in your code. Steve, we just had a, a quick question there, direct. Oh, yeah. um, will BICEP eventually replace the ARM templates? Oh, good question. Um, it won't. Um, so the ARM, so you've got the API, the API, um, the ARM API will only take, it just takes in 
JSON. That's not changing. The API itself is saying is, is completely static. So the ARM resource manager, the Azure resource manager stays totally consistent. Nothing's changed at that level. Bicep just is, an, is, a, is a declarative language that sit that will spit out and, and build ARM templates for you um, under the hood. And then those ARM templates, like they currently do today, that, that's what talks directly to the uh, ARM API to build your resources or change your resources. So no, so ARM isn't going anywhere. It's staying exactly the same. You can still use your ARM templates. Nothing changes. Bicep is just another layer that sits on top. Um, my, uh, I've got ever such a tiny little quick demo just to show you how easy it is. Um, this won't take a second because I know, apologies, I know I'm running over. Um, there we go. So, <clears throat> Uh, this here, if you can see my screen, um, I'll have to just do a cut down one. This is a bicep file and that provisions a storage account. Just nothing more, just create a storage account. Um, if, I, if I just run this now, um, over here, so this is 18, well, it's not even 18 lines, I've commented that out. So this is, what, 16 lines of, of, of bicep. I've just this second just run bicep build main.bicep. And that's converted that into JSON. So this is what we'd have to write before bicep. And it's nearly 40 lines and not commented. Um, and it's just far more verbose. And yet they do exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing. There is no difference. Um, so if you see here in my storage accounts, I meant to delete that before. Um, I thought I was going yes to delete this. Here's one I prepared earlier, so to speak. So you can see in my environment, I've just got I've got just two hub shell storage storage accounts, nothing more. Uh, let's hope this works. Eh? Um, so if I now run my uh, AZ deployment group create, so I'm just going to deploy this bicep file. That's the key thing. So just make sure you know I'm not cheating. I'm just going to delete my uh, JSON file. So I'll run this and cross my fingers. Uh, running. Steve, and, another question coming. Uh, is yeah. Bicep like Terraform? Is it, is it oh, that's another good question. I'm going to touch on that. Um, it is. Um, it's again, it's another abstraction layer. So Terraform, um, you would write your Terraform, and then Terraform would effectively create a load of JSON files, a load of ARM JSON files, and those JSON files are what you would submit to the ARM API. Uh, Bicep does exactly the same thing. The difference is Bicep, because it's Azure native, um, it means anything that you can do with ARM JSON, anything the API supports, Bicep will support natively as well. So there's no lead time that you haven't got to wait for the tools to be updated. It is native, which means, so with Terraform, there is normally a gap from when Microsoft announced something um, and when Terraform can support it, because the language just hasn't needs to be updated. Um, let me get this refresh. Go on. Give it a second for it to finish coming through. But anyway, you can see it has created me a nice shiny storage account. Uh, just waiting for it to show up in the portal, but I'll be there shortly. The, um, the and the other the other so the, the disadvantage with Bicep compared to Terraform is that it's not cloud agnostic. It is only for Azure. The positive is there is no long, you don't need a state file to say what the reality, you think the reality is, um, which needs to be maintained and has uh, version control and you've got to share it between your developers or your, your DevOps guys. So that if you're, if you're not going multi-cloud and you just, and you're using Terraform because it's easier to use than Bicep, um, which it, you know, it is, um, then you might as well just stick with, you might as well just go move to Bicep and save yourself the Terraform overhead. If you want to go multi-cloud, then uh, Terraform is still the way to go. I've still got a lot of love for, for, for Bicep. Um, it's just taking a little while for it to load up. Why is it taking a while to load up? I don't know. Um, trust me, it works. <laughs> you can see in the, you can see this is the JSON coming back. So we can see this is coming back saying, um, all is good, um, all is good in the world. I'll back Bicep test. No, it still isn't showing up. I think it's just running a bit slow in the back end. But uh, yeah, this has created me my in my resource group bicep test. Uh, I should have a storage account bicep storage test one two three. Um, I think it's just running a little bit slow for it to appear in the in the portal. Um, but it definitely definitely does work. It certainly built it and it's confirmed it worked. Um, typical, isn't it? Um, so that's that's that. Again, uh, I also got another one which here which just creates some containers as well. Um, uh, 
That's and let's see if there's Steve, conscious of just a couple of minutes there to kind of uh, wrap up. Do we want to talk about yeah. some of the accelerators then? And we can then yes. hold on if anyone's got any uh, questions at the end. Um, yep. Uh, certainly, let me attempt to reshare my screen, get away from my uh, getting too geeky. Apologies. Um, where are we? So, there's um, something. So I've only been with Silver Sands since the start of the year, but I've been obviously working um, at MSPs and consultancies for, for quite a few years now. Um, as part of that, um, one of the things I want to do at Silver Sands is to uh, Try and get some more, some what we call, what I call accelerators, um, put together. Where we've got these best practices uh, from Microsoft and from Silver Sands and sort of the wider industry, all wrapped up together. Um, so in doing so, um, let me go to the slide. So what we've done is I've put together um, some uh, this accelerator. Um, this is a sort of a pre-packaged. Um, uh, high level design is the overall output, but really spend a week, a week, it's a week long engagement, which is over a week long engagement, sitting down, trying to understand what the requirements are of the business, uh, where you are with cloud, where you want to get to. And the, the outcome of this really is a deep, sort of a high level design that covers off um, various key areas, but around governance and subscriptions, networking, security, compliance, risk, identity, VMs, um, storage, backup, that kind of stuff. All the core foundations, all the underpinnings that's needed so that you can then go forth. The big advantage with, with Azure um, and, and Cloud is the self-service and self-provisioning nature of it. The downside is if the guardrails aren't in place, you get this sprawl, things aren't done securely, um, you get leaky data um, and it becomes just really hard to manage long term, even with all these great tools. So really the point of the Cloud Foundation um, Accelerator is to understand what the business requires and then come up with a, with a high level design document um, that puts the guardrails in place to ensure you've got a really solid baseline and a really solid uh, grounding so that you can then start provisioning virtual machines or app services or SQL instances um, as you need and your networking is taken care of, your identity is taken care of, your backups in place, your storage, all the fundamental bits and pieces, all of your core infrastructure elements are in place. Um, which you still need to do in the cloud world just because you can provision things without considering this stuff doesn't mean you should um, and it means that you've, you've got this confidence going forward um, that you've got the, the this really solid bedrock to move forward um, with and you haven't got to worry too much about those details because it's been taken care of with this with this um, sort of uh, fixed engagement uh, where we give you this, this high level design document we cover off various workshops as well um, including sort of some non-technical ones and some business level ones as well as a handful of technical workshops as well um, and again, it's not it's not just a one way street. It, it's not just us getting information from you from the from the client. It's trying to impart some technical knowledge as well, um, and really answer any questions. Make sure you guys, you know, the, the client's going to be comfortable um, in managing things going forward, so they understand the nuts and bolts why we're coming to certain decisions. Um, and so it's a, it's a two way conversation to get something that's that's bespoke and specific to what what you know the IT department and the wider business needs. Um, for their for their cloud, and if and at that point they can go forth and build the HLD themselves. They can go to a third party, or ideally they'll go to Silver Sands and say, "We're happy with the design; it's really good. Would you mind going forth and building that for us, please?" Um, so, and take it from that point. Um, so thank you for that, Steve. So um, that's really helpful. So uh, what I've done is I've pasted a link to the survey in the chat. Um, if you do want any information around that Microsoft Cloud Accelerator uh, or the Azure Stack HCI, uh, please just comment in, in the feedback form. It only takes 30 seconds to fill in. Um, I'm conscious of time as well. There was one question that's come in from Dan that just dropped out there. Bear with me two secs. Uh, he dropped out earlier and he said, is the Azure portal and Windows Admin Center replacing System Center for on-premise management? That's a good question. Um, so for it... Officially, no. So Windows Admin Center is the direction Microsoft are trying to get people to go in, um, and it, it really is worthwhile. It is superb, um, and it's free. Uh, I forgot to mention that. Um, and it, again, it's quite mature as well. The it's um, it's there are there's a lot of automation capabilities that it can't that it doesn't have natively. Um, but again, you have that with Azure. So the Azure portal and Windows Admin Center is the direction they are going in. There is very limited work, shall we say, um, certainly from the great right here on the grapevine from Microsoft, that they're not going to be putting significant investment into systems in the long term. 
um, it, the intention is really is for a combination of Winners Admin Centre and Azure Arc to your management plane, whether it's on premises, another cloud, or within Azure natively, is really to be using the Azure portal and the Azure features there for your management um, across the board. Fantastic. Thanks, Steve. And are there any other questions? Uh, there's a few as, as we've gone. Um, if not, feel free to, to post them in the survey link again. We can we can come back if, if you have any questions after the event. Um, but other than that, no, I think there's there's no more questions coming through the feed. So, if, uh, oh, oh yeah, is there a uh, packer alt in Azure? Steve, that's a question that's come in. Steve, you're on mute. Sorry, I don't know if you just. Oh, sorry. Uh, Pat, I'm not too sure um, what's meant by Packer Alt. Um, Are you able to elaborate on that, please? Yeah, so I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what um, what what they mean by Packer. Um, so Packer part of HashiCorp says an alternative live terrible. Oh, sort of in relation to infrastructure as code. Mm -hmm. um, it, as the the like the machine learn, um, uh, sort of the, the machine image that that's um, the, 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 not as such. Um, it sort of it depends what the intention is. So there isn't a direct equivalent um, of, of of Packer itself. Uh, within it within Azure, um, but you you can still have bespoke images within Azure anyway. So it also it sort of depends on what it is that you're trying to do and trying to achieve. Um, so you you can you, you can build your own marketplace effectively within Azure. So you can build your own images. You can build those using automation tools without having to use Packer. Um, and then you can upload those to the Azure marketplace, a private Azure marketplace if needs be, and deploy that and deploy those within the Azure portal. Um, so again, it sort of depends um, what it is you're trying to do. If you've got a pipeline that uses Packer to build an, a specific image for a, a particular sort of a application stack that you're doing, um, I'm not I'm not aware of an, anything natively by Microsoft that does that. Um, there, it may well be that's one of those corners um, where, where HashiCorp have probably got a, a, a good advantage on these sort of niches. So these more, but it would depend on what you're using it for. Um, like I said if it's a, if the image itself is relatively static, um, and you could do your configuration management that's needed within your pipeline. If you if you, you could probably do that using various other tools that are native within Azure to apply the same. Uh, configuration that's required. Uh, or you could even do that using just something as relatively crude as like desired state configuration in PowerShell um, and use some automation run books to do that. So as part of your CI CD pipeline, the configuration gets updated at that point, like it does now, I presume, um, based on the question, and it then feeds that into your into, uh, updates the PowerShell um, for your desired state configuration. And so your server just reapplies its configuration at that point anyway, so you, you might get the same effect using another method, um, but not a, there's not a direct comparison, but there are probably another way to achieve the same result, I would suspect. Cool, thank you, Steve. Um, OK, so uh, again, conscious of time there, so I just want to thank you, Steve, for, for that. It's really useful. Great updates there on security and, and the platform there. Um, if there are any other questions, please feel free to pop them in the survey. We really hope you've enjoyed today's webinar and a copy of the recording will be sent out shortly after. Um, so, yeah, thank you, everyone, and we'll see you soon. Great. OK, thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.